Open the podcast bay door as hell. Welcome to episode 91 of Welcome to Geek Town. I'm your host, Kurt Onstead. We're continuing our deep dive into the Loki show with guest Anne Valiant. Although I'm skipping most of the longer intro this time around, I do need to take a moment to thank my patrons. Denise Benick, Jesse Clark, Ricky Garvin, Rob Garrison, Forrest Woodward, Aaron Borst, Carla Hoffman, Lyndon Onstead, John Breen, Julio Herrera, Matthew Saint, and Utuk Zul all help keep this show running, and it's truly appreciated. Remember, it's just a dollar per month to join them, and right now, perks include an early release of the unedited conversation between Anne and myself. Speaking of that conversation, let's get into it, as Anne and I discuss the location of the opening scene of the second episode, which is a very familiar setting for both of us. <laughs> okay, here's the funny part. Pretty sure my husband has actually been to that Ren Fair. Well, specifically, <laughs> there is no Ren Fair in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. I looked it up. There is the Bristol Renaissance Fair yep. in Kenosha that has been around since 1973. Yeah. So having it be in 1985 works. Yeah, I wanted to look that up and make sure that that all jibed with the timeline as we know it. Well, and that being said, I work for the Southern California Renaissance Fair. And one of the things that kind of made me go in uh, this scene was that while their extras who were not dressed up for fair looked 1985, their fair participants and guests who were in costume, Mm -hmm. those costumes were too fantasy modern okay if that makes any sense it does to me but maybe you can go into a little bit more detail the style of costume worn at renaissance fairs by patrons and even with the folks who work there will often reflect the style of their actual present time period it will depend on what is fashionable it'll depend on what new research has shown up it'll de- depend on what the era that the fair wants to reflect corsets have gotten like victorian corsets we see out at fair quite a bit more than you did earlier thank you steampunk (laughs) otherwise you wouldn't see corsets you would see the vest shaped bodice which is traditional the hairstyles again by patrons were different than the hairstyles they would have in 1985. some of them i saw some 80s the girl who had the spoken lines she looked very 80s they made sure that she actually looked from the time period she was supposed to be. But my guess is when they did a call for extras, they said, hey, we're looking for people who have Ren Faire outfits. Uh, that makes total sense. And so whatever these guys, when they were shooting in, let's say 2019, had in their closets is what they put on, even if they did not reflect the time period in which it was shot. The patrons at a 1985 fair would more likely have stuff that is a little more Excalibur based than Victorian steampunk Mm -hmm. or something to that effect. That is a excessively small detail for anybody to get hung up on. (laughs) Oh yeah. It's something that I kind of noticed, but didn't take me out of it because I understand that there are limitations and they're not going to go for the level of detail that someone like you or I would necessarily notice. Yeah. Uh, If you want to see what a Renaissance fair in the late 80s, early 90s looks like, look up Quest of the Delta Knights which is terrible, and a Mystery Science Theater 3000 episode. (laughs) Then you can see late 80s, early 90s, Renaissance look. (laughs) 
let me note one other thing on the Ren Fair that I have to, again, I'm going to admit a thing that bugged me. Commit to the rain or don't commit to the rain. Because the, you could hear the rain hitting, but people were not acting like it was rainy. So choose one. Yeah, it was foggy out and misting at times. You could see Loki's breath at one scene. Yeah, a little inconsistency when it comes to weather. But again, that's not something that's completely in their control. No. Unless they decide to have it be raining and bring out the rain machines to yeah. do that. I will, and I just think that they should say, well, hell, it's raining. Let's grab some umbrellas and people go to fair when it's still raining. So at least I hear this is southern yeah. california it doesn't do that here well from the little bit i read on reddit it doesn't do that at the time that wisconsin holds its ren fair <laughs> either it's true <laughs> the people i saw making comments were when i looked up where the ren fairs actually ha happen in wisconsin they were saying oh if only you could see your breath when you were walking around <laughs> Maryland Ren Fair, Ren Fest, excuse me, the Fest Renaissance Festival in Maryland uh, starts in August in Maryland. Uh, I don't know how more people don't die every year because uh, <laughs> August in Maryland, over 90 degrees, over 90% humidity. Yeah, no thank you. <sighs> Well, let's move on from these details and get into the details of the show itself. We get the Minutemen arriving and they, they go into the tent and the announcement starts playing of the epic battle that people are about to witness. Right. Which very much felt like a medieval times sort oh, of thing. Oh, yes, it did. But I'm sure that that's not at all inaccurate for 80s Renaissance Fair. And then we get our first real musical cue, which is Holding Out for a Hero by Bonnie Tyler. Nice. <laughs> As the variant Loki mind controls C-20 and she fights the rest of the squad. I thought the choreography on this was really nice. It was. And again, the, the musical cue was spot on. Excellent and choice. I'm going to have something else to say about it at the very end of the episode. Oh, okay. But of course, Loki prevails. C-20 falls unconscious after the mind control is over. And this variant takes off with C-20 and the usual reset charges. Did not seem very difficult for the variant to haul poor C-20 around like a rag doll. No, I mean, even if Loki is not Thor strength, still a god. Yeah. <laughs> if he can take the beating that Hulk gave him at the end of Avengers and not be internally bleeding and have his bones crushed to the point of not being able to walk around anymore. Yeah. If he can get up and walk away from that after a little bit of moaning, he has to be stronger than the average person. <laughs> Fair enough. Speaking of that, Loki, we now cut to him at his new desk. <laughs> uh, it's implied later that it's actually Mobius's desk. And he's just camping it in order to study. Well, maybe. Maybe. Yeah, I'm not I'm not clear whether it's Loki's own desk that he has his own cubicle or if it's Mobius's. Right. Either way, he is reading Mobius's magazine. <laughs> exactly. A jet ski magazine. <laughs> I'd love to go on a jet ski. They look like a lot of fun. You and Mobius, uh, y'all can uh, <laughs> have fun on your jet skis. Uh, actually, I'm not opposed to a jet ski. But that's beside the point. Um, well, I mean, they talk about it later. Um, yeah, we'll get yeah. into that a little bit more. When we get there. We, exactly. In the meantime, we get to learn a little bit more about Miss Minutes, who <laughs> was originally just the narrator of the exposition dump from last episode. But we find out now is a living-ish creature. Yeah, she is a being in her own right. Yes. She is there as a tutor, and she can move of her own volition. So when Loki swacks at her with the magazine, she can dodge it and eventually hops into the computer. 
I mean, when he asks her, are you a recording or are you alive? And she says, well, <laughs> sort of both. <laughs> so yeah, she is a, well, electronic creature, I would say, of some sort. She's a pixie. And we also learn some of the rules about time travel here. Uh, the big one is that the red line that they have referenced throughout is the point at which they can no longer reset the timeline. Right. Well, and they push that at least twice. Mm -hmm. uh, not only right here with Miss Minutes, but later when it becomes a little more specifically relevant. Right. I like how they're parsing out this information. Mm -hmm. In that first episode, we had that giant exposition dump of the cartoon, which was fun, yeah. but still a giant exposition dump. Here, it's parsed out a little bit more piecemeal and fitting in with the story and the characters and how things would naturally occur in a conversation. Well, and it's far more specific as well. The cartoon was a nice little overview of here's how all this happens and here's what we do. La, the training from Miss Minutes and whatever other training materials Loki has uh, had to suffer through. Well, lots of training videos. We lots know. of training vi videos. <laughs> Although he didn't watch all of them. Ugh. Those are far more specific. That gets into minutia, mm -hmm. you know, on how these things work, including the red line. Yeah, and that's going to become very important in just a little bit. Uh, but first, Mobius shows up and hands Loki his, the rest of his uniform. <laughs> and I figure now is a good time to ask about Patty Cake's swoon factor. The Patty Cake's swoon scale of episode two of Loki, the variant. Nine out of ten. Tom was so good at this episode love that they showed how hard loki works like we all knew he was intelligent but the way they demonstrate that was amazing and i feel like i now need a show with just him and miss minutes i felt like he is part trickster and part anti-hero and that i love all right yeah I, I think we hit patty's sweet spot on this one <clears throat> <laughs> i'm gonna disagree with her a little bit later at least on some of it but hey this is the swoon scale not the uh logical character analysis scale yes but he is definitely smartly dressed in his tie and jacket well and i'd like to talk about some of the details of the tva clothing okay go for it because this distracted me hugely on the first viewing of it because of who i am as a human being the collars of his and mobius's shirts are built into the shirt instead of a colored shirt that stops at points it is a tunnel and it goes into the armpits. It is built in, but there is a tunnel for the tie to go through. Mobius's jacket does not physically have a lapel like a traditional suit jacket. It seems like there's another layer coming from the shoulder into the chest that has the cutout of the lapel. So it's coming from the wrong direction, but there's no physical lapel in it. Hmm. It's weird and I like it. And I like what it's thinking. The belt buckles, I'll say TVA. The judge also has a either necklace or a scarf pin that says TVA. Um, and the TVA teams, not the ones in armor and not the agents, the other ones, the support staff, I guess. Yeah. They are wearing split clothing, which means one side is a dark maroon and the other side is a dark orange. And they're split right down the middle vertically which means that the costume designer has got two shirts that were the same type, but two different colors and the same size, and they split them in half, and that's how they made them. <laughs> okay. I went to fashion school. Yeah. After the, the fashion intro. With the pop collar. Of course. Gotta have the pop collar. Well, he's going to the 80s. It makes he sense. is going to the 80s, it's true. <laughs> But we get the briefing for the mission that they are going on, and we get to see some other Loki variants. This raises questions. All right. I was wondering for you if this was going to raise questions or you were going to go, okay, so this is Loki from then, and this is Loki from then, and this is Loki from then. So these are all <laughs> questions for you. Interesting. 
Well, one of them specifically I saw and was like, okay, this has a perfectly reasonable explanation within the timeline that we know. Okay. But here's the thing. We know that timelines split off and create these variant timelines. But what I don't understand is how a variant timeline would create a completely different looking Loki. Because if there is one timeline that occasionally branches off from a decision made, then everything that the other variant Lokis we see experienced should match up to what our Loki has experienced up to the point that they branch off. And so if there's a Loki that was born with horns and fur and huge bulky muscles, when did that branch off of the timeline in such a way that this variant could then go out and do things? Well, the TVA is all over the timeline. So maybe these are Lokis that popped up at different points instead of just at 2012, essentially. I mean, the Loki we have is the 2012 Loki that made a break for it with the Tesseract. Right. Uh, Meanwhile, we have monster Loki, who maybe is a Loki at some point who said, hey, let's see what gamma rays are like. And uh, hulked himself out, which would be the, the monster version. And that purely supposition on my part wild oh yeah yeah and one of them is a very much a viking look of loki the last one at least the last one on my list yeah and you know maybe that one was from a very early version probably a loki who went back to hang out with his nordic ancestors predecessors successors i don't know the people who worshipped him as a god at some point worshippers yes those guys (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you know and it got bedecked in proper scandinavian look if that wasn't technically a proper scandinavian look but you know right but then that explains that loki to a certain extent but then you have bicyclist loki <laughs> the, the one who appears to have worn won the tour de france we oui. yeah You know, that could be any time between whenever they started wearing those particular style of outfits. Yeah, but again, it's just odd that he is so much different from anything that the Loki we know has experienced. Yeah, fair. I do not know what his motivation to do the Tour de France is. I mean, maybe it's just (laughs) a mess with Lance Armstrong. So, yeah. But the the blue-skinned Loki, the first one that they show, Mm -hmm. was the one that I thought had the most reasonable explanation, which was when he got the cask of Endless Winter in the first Thor. Right. uh, We see him turn blue. And so there could be something that an alternate version of him did at some point that kept him blue permanently. Uh, So that one was the least unusual They seem to kind of go in an order of ridiculousness. I did love our Loki's look when the bicyclist showed up. (laughs) He just gives us like, wait, what? (laughs) And our Loki gets a new nickname during the briefing from Mobius, Professor Loki. Oh, that's right. Because Loki explained part of his magic with some great, very specific detail. Yes. That everybody's like, I mean, you and I both have things we could explain into that level of minute detail that your common audience is going, why? I don't, it it doesn't matter. Don't need to know that. Yeah. I don't need to tell you the difference between an overlock and a flat stitch, but I know the difference. And it's useful for you. Yes. But it is not useful for most people. And that's totally fine. Yeah. But yeah, Loki is trying desperately hard to prove his usefulness at this point. Yes. He wants to be seen as a valuable member of the team before they go so that his little scheme that we'll get to in a second has a better chance of working. Right. 
as they leave to go on the mission, we do find out that, as expected, Loki's magic will return once he leaves the TVA and is back in the, let's call it, the regular universe. Right. But he does not get his knives. No, doesn't get his knives. (laughs) And now we find out a few more rules here in that you can't arrive before the Nexus event in order to prevent it. Right. The Nexus events destabilize the time flow, and so you've got to show up in real time after they've occurred in order to interact with them. Right. You have to continually clarify the rules of time travel within this universe in order to make sure that we're on the right rules of time travel. Yes. Because there are many. (laughs) Yeah. Episode 31 of this podcast is where I talked about some of the different universes and their various rules. Right. Including the Marvel Universe because I was, it was specifically right after Endgame came out. Nice. The way that they set this up dialogue wise, pretty much as a quiz. Yeah. Yeah. Mobius saying, okay, so do you understand this thing? And Loki going, yeah, yeah, I understand this thing. Ugh. And then we also get a further explanation of the red line as they proceed into the tent. In addition to talking about the reset charges and what exactly they do. And so it sounds like basically the reset charges disintegrate or delete everything that was changed by the Nexus event within a certain radius. And then that deletion allows the timeline to, they show it as retreating, but I kind of think of it as branching back in. Yes, that makes sense. So you could almost look at the little branches as little ripples that come out. And then Mm -hmm. as soon as the reset charge hits, goes right back into the main timeline. And so when you combine the knowledge we just learned about the reset charges with what we know about the red line, I think that tells us that reset charges have a limit on how far out they can go. Yeah. And so as things cascade and grow, as soon as you hit that red line, that's where things have changed outside of the limit of the reset charges radius. And so depending on how much things change, you know, if you set off a bomb, say, in a very populated area, that's going to ripple out to a large radius very, very quickly. Yes. Whereas if you just don't cross the street when you're supposed to, that's going to take a while for the ripples to reach out. And so that's why things can go faster or slower towards that red line. That makes sense. But now that we know all these little rules, (laughs) we get to the investigation of the crime scene. Which is straight from every cop show and every procedural that has ever been. (laughs) Yeah. I don't know about you, but I saw through Loki's monologuing right away. (laughs) I think it took me to about halfway. The drama builds. Okay. You know, he's pretty good at, you know, start to, and it's like, oh, they're buying it. They're buying it. They're buying it. It's a slope going up. And there comes a point where that is enough. But Loki tends to take the step over that line. He overplays his hand every time. He definitely goes too far. Almost every time. For me, it was about when he started saying, you remind me of the Asgardians. Ah. When I was like, okay, you're reaching. Yeah. That's about where I started saying, okay, he's not actually being helpful at this point. He's just trying to get in with the group and use them to his advantage. Yeah, he's totally stalling for time at that point. Yeah, but fortunately, Mobius sees right through it. (laughs) I think it took him a while to see right right through it, though. I mean, I think B-15 saw right through it. I think B-15 never gave him a chance. I think B-15 assumed from the beginning that it was a ploy. I think Mobius gave him enough rope to hang himself with. Let him speak and say, okay, I'll I'll listen. Let's find out where you're going with this. And then saw through it and said, okay, I know what this is. Right. 
And so they reset the timeline and we have C-20 missing in action, according to the screen we see back at the TVA. Well, and there are some looks exchanged that they are very concerned about this. I'm guessing that MIA doesn't happen very often. Oh, you would think not. If you can go to anywhere in time that you need to, any place and anywhere in time that you need to, how would someone go missing? Yeah. So yeah, it's extraordinarily rare that you're going to have an MIA Minuteman. And so it is obviously a concern. And we find out later with very good reason, because she has knowledge that you do not want getting out into the general public, let alone someone who's actively working against the TVA. No, you do not. And the next scene we get to is Ravona and Mobius having their meeting in her office. Mm -hmm. And again, with the technology that never quite caught on. And I think this is true with, because you mentioned the soda last time, Mm -hmm. that it was a Pepsi product that existed, but never caught on. Yeah, I found out a little more detail. It wasn't a cola. It was an energy drink. Uh It was an early equivalent of Monster. Okay. But yeah, it still though, it was an energy beverage, didn't catch on. There's another drink later on that I think was the same thing. I have some vague memory, Mm -hmm. memory of it from back in the day. But yeah, I mean, all these little technological or things that existed, but not for long. You know, they don't actually stick in anybody's memory. Or in this case, because I'm specifically talking about the theremin. (laughs) Because that's the music that is playing in the office as they're discussing is a solo theremin piece. Oh, yeah. And so it's something that is still around. If you absolutely need to get one, you can. Yep. But never really caught on with the public in general. So yeah, they're having their meeting. They're listening to theremin fugue in A minor or whatever it is. (laughs) And we learn a little bit more about Ravona and Mobius's relationship. This is also the first time that Ravona's name actually gets said in the episode. And later, as he's walking out of her office, you actually can see a plaque above her door that spells out her name mm-hmm. in its entirety. So we do get complete verification that, yes, this is Ravona Renslayer, who, if you want a little more detail about her, just go back to the previous episode <laughs> and I discuss her comic book origins there. Well, and I think one of the big things that tells us about their relationship are the drink rings that are on the side table of how much time <laughs> Mobius spends in this office office you know enough to have produced drink rings and enough times that she's like to get a coaster you do this every time exactly she thinks he should be trained yeah but he is not the only one who spends time in her office because she has more than one analyst that works under her right and people on the internet are theorizing and latching on to any tiny little thing to try to find the next big Marvel character that is going to show up in the MCU. I am not going to do that this time around because it doesn't seem like it's... The Marvel Universe seems to be baiting you guys and not delivering. (laughs) Well, yeah, that's very true. It seems like they are throwing these things in specifically to get you theorizing, but are never going to deliver on any of those actual theories, especially with something as minor as a Franklin D. Roosevelt high school pen. Right. That does not actually mean anything. I'm sorry, but the Molecule Man is not going to show up in Loki because of a pen. So that theory is out there. Go ahead and and read about it elsewhere, but I'm not going to dive into the details on that because I think the chances of it actually happening are near nil. But what we did find out in this scene that I did find interesting is that Mobius has never met the Timekeepers. Yeah, I find it interesting. I don't think a lot of people have ever met the Timekeepers. you got to get to a certain level to have met the Timekeepers. 
And as we've said before, Mobius is pretty much middle management. You know, he can get an audience with the judge, but he's not getting an audience with the timekeeper. Now, it's hilarious that he keeps throwing that as bait out to Loki. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But I don't know if it's necessarily something he's like, yeah, sure, I can do this. So, yeah, we don't even know if Mobius has the power to follow through on the carrot that he is trying to lead Loki forward with. Since he's never met the Timekeepers himself, does he have the power to get Loki a meeting with the Timekeepers? But more importantly, I think this is another hint that the Timekeepers may not be what we're told they are. Right. Either their motivation is not nearly as pure as we are given to believe, or even their existence may not be as true as it has been intimated in the show. As somebody who has read entirely too much dystopian fiction and allegory towards the Cold War for the most part, yeah, no way. No way are the timekeepers, three actual gods who decided to design a timeline and say this is the one. It's something else. There's a lot more to that than the simplistic, you know, there are three timekeepers, they created the sacred timeline, and now we do their bidding to make sure it moves smoothly. I do find it interesting that Ravona said that the timekeepers are monitoring this case closely. Because once again, that's a very big brothery Cold War thing. Right. You know, of having somebody looking over your shoulder. Uh, Between the only music that anybody plays is classical and the giant statues that are constantly looking over things, it's still that keeps giving me that Cold War feeling to it. The 1984 vibe that you talked about in the previous episode. Yeah. And the deep levels of the bureaucratic process to get anything done in the TVA. Mm -hmm. That's very Cold War, actual historical Cold War. Right. The Russians love their bureaucracy even before the Soviet Union. And after. And after. (laughs) It's basically intimated that Ravona has met the timekeepers. Mm-hmm. So if my theory is true, then either Ravona is lying about that or she has also been bamboozled by them right. in some way. And because she has such a villainous comic book past, I tend to think that it might be the former rather than the latter. Yeah, between who knows what, as an audience member, your perception of the timekeepers being this real thing or this sham thing is going to be colored differently. You know, again, from Mm -hmm. where you're coming from, Ravona, she's got a past in the comic books. Therefore, she might be lying. For me, I'm going to go, but there's also plenty of audience that could just be taking all of this at a surface level word. Oh, yeah, definitely. Which, of course, is what they want you to do. (laughs) Well, I think they want a mix. I think they want some people to be watching it and be totally surprised by whatever twists and turns. But I think they also do want the comic book blogosphere putting out all of their theories about where this is headed. Right. Just As long as you let your theories be theories and not become expectations and influence how you feel the show did or did not work, that's fine. Absolutely agree on that. There are so many folks who are like, and they ruined it for me. Yeah, I'm not. Yeah, it's because you they didn't they didn't bring mutants into one division. It's ruined. They screwed it up. They Yeah. yeah, yeah. That if that's all you're watching the show for is for additional connections and new characters then you're not there for the right reasons man yeah just enjoy it for the story that it is yes and if you get additional pleasure out of theorizing like we're doing right now great but don't let it color your view of the show's outcome yeah of the show's outcome yeah all right i'll just step off of my soapbox here (laughs) And (laughs) careful, man, don't fall down. It's kind of high. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) And we'll get to Mobius leaving that meeting with Ravona. And we see that Mobius has lost his patience. 
Yep. He is no longer on Loki's side anymore. He is just like, this is your last chance. And I loved the line at the end of that exchange where Loki asks, well, why are you still talking to me then if this is how you feel? And his line is, I'll give you two options and you it's up to you which one you think is right. Either I see a scared little boy shivering in the cold and you kind of feel bad for that ice runt or B, I just want to catch this guy and I'll tell you whatever I need to. Yeah, I mean, who's playing the manipulation game here? Um, yeah, Loki says in the scene that he is 10 steps ahead of everyone else, but no, he's not. No, he's not. <laughs> well, no. No, this is where I kind of disagree with Patty. Yes. In that a lot of the times, a lot of times in this episode, we see him quote unquote scheming, but everyone's just seeing right through him. He's not fooling anyone. For the god of lies, he has a horrible poker face. (laughs) (laughs) Well, he always dips into the smarm real hard, real fast. Oh, yeah. He's got that move where he puts his arms out and he smirks at you and you're like, okay, here comes the bull. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. But the question then becomes... Is that him actually trying something or is that him testing? I think the answer is both. You know, you try a thing. If it worked, great. Let's go with it. But if it doesn't work, then he moves on to the next plan. I don't think he's distressed when a lot of the small plans don't work. Mm -hmm. You know, the little manipulations, little schemes, it tells him as much in its failure as it does in its success. Fair enough. So it's experiments. Yeah, but it seems like his go-to move has not worked enough times that he should have moved on by this point. Somebody who is hundreds of years, if not thousands of years old, and has had as much experience as him should know better. Fair, but at this point, what else does he have to work with? (laughs) i mean he's in he's a stranger in a strange land i mean it's a really strange land and he has nothing but his brains and smarm to get by on i can see that but again i just think he he should know by this point to turn down the smart (laughs) it makes patty swoon come on well fair enough enjoy patty (laughs) (laughs) Meanwhile, we get to enjoy Loki and Mobius heading to the library or records area. And Loki has to look through all of the case reports for the other variant to see if there's anything that they've missed. Right. And here we get more of that Brazil-like bureaucracy that I noted. And oh, yeah. Discussed a little bit just earlier where he wants to get records for the creation of the TVA or the beginning of time or the end of time. But he walks up and he's like, hello, hello, ring the bell. She turns. Yes. How can I help you? That's the bureaucratic process. She will not answer until you go through the process. You have to have your ticket. You have to ring the bell. You have to go through the exact steps. That level of bureaucracy completely frustrates me in real life, but it is very entertaining to watch. Well, and it does kind of beg the question, is her ignoring him saying hello because of bureaucracy, or does she just not process that there's somebody else there until the bell is rung? And that tells her that is something that needs her attention. The TVA... And all the beings in it were theoretically created by the timekeepers. They may have set up the bureaucracy so that people within the TVA only respond to their function, unless seriously goaded like poor Casey. That makes sense, especially when you look at the TVA in the comics. Mm -hmm. The lowest level employees of the TVA, shall we say, are literally faceless drones. Yeah. There is a completely blanked, smooth head 
man at a desk for every single timeline in the Marvel Universe. And so you literally have this just wall of floating desks with faceless, expressionless men just typing away and watching over each of the timelines. Right. And so it could be that the woman at the library is programmed to only respond at her job after the bell rings. That seems to contradict most of what we've seen of the TVA characters that we've met. Most of them have proper personalities. Yeah, they're not so robotic that they can't act on their own and respond if someone says hello to them. Right. But this one is very serious about her job and oh, yeah. is following the rules to the letter. And so when he asks for the records that he is allowed to have, she gives them to him. And the only records that he's allowed to have are his own. So he learns more about his prime timeline version of himself here. And this is where he learns about the destruction of Asgard. I thought he was already aware of the destruction of Asgard. I thought episode one, he learned something about that. Maybe he did not. I, I could be right I, or wrong. I don't think he I did. I could be crazy. I don't think we saw Searcher destroying Asgard in the clips that he saw. He saw his death. Right. But that doesn't tell him where he was necessarily. Yeah. I believe he saw himself walking next to Thor and Valkyrie. But that has no context for Exactly. Him. Yeah. So I think this is where he learns of the destruction of Asgard, yeah. of Ragnarok. Yeah, and that does bring an emotional moment for him. And that pain seems to bring a certain amount of focus. Yes. Because he finally sees some words that mean something. Yeah, he gives him that Sherlock Holmes house moment of the random thing putting things together in his head and coming to a realization. And that's that this other Loki is hiding in apocalypses. They Apoca use apocalypses. They use apocalypse might be more accurate. I like apocalypse. I personally like apocalypse. If there's also a book series called The Chronicles of St. Mary's by Jody Taylor, which Mr. Time Travel fan, I recommend you read at some point. Okay. But it's very historical as well. It's really good if you like historical fiction and or time travel. Mm -hmm. But they come to a very similar conclusion about apocalypses. Oh, okay. In that it is easy to hide in them. Yeah. There are things you can do when apocalypses are imminent. It makes total sense. Yeah. His, his explanation with the salad, salt, pepper, and juice box. <laughs> Ruining everybody's lunch, but making a good plan. <laughs> it's a good illustration. It's a good explanation. Yeah. And so he wants to visit an apocalypse to test his theory out. And of course, being Loki, his first suggestion is let's go to Ragnarok. But uh, Mobius turns that down immediately. Oh, yeah. And it takes a little bit for Loki to convince him to even try this in the first place. Yeah. I mean, Loki's been pulling various manipulations the entire episode. So, yeah. And Mobius is very rightly concerned that Loki is going to stab him in the back. You've done it like 50 times. <laughs> yes, you've literally stabbed people in the back like 50 times. I'd never do it again. It's gotten old. That never gets old. Come on. No, it really doesn't. As someone who often plays a rogue in Dungeons and Dragons, backstabbing never gets old. <laughs> never gets old. Nope. <laughs> And Loki says probably the most honest thing he's ever said in this show, at least, to finally convince Mobius, which is, you don't trust me, but you can trust one thing. I love to be right. That is definitely the most honest thing he's ever said. No, that, <laughs> yeah. And I, I understand. I really do. On a very deep level, I really enjoy being right. Yeah, I think yeah. we all do to one extent or another, but I think we can agree that Loki takes it to an extreme that is at least one of the sources of his villainy. Correct. It's a scale, you know, a sliding scale. Yes. Loki's on the far end. They're 
somebody who doesn't care at all is on the other end. Yeah. Yeah. Extremes are always bad or almost always because, you know, I don't want to get too extreme. Really? <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah. Good. All right. But the apocalypse they do choose to visit is Pompeii in 79 AD. A popular apocalypse. Uh, incidentally, I've seen it used a couple times in some time travel uh, yeah. pieces. The one I remember very strongly is Doctor Who. Yes. Um, and they use it in the Chronicles of St. Mary's as well to hide all sorts of shenanigans. Makes sense. And mostly hoping to not die in the process. Uh, I really enjoyed a lot of the scene because once Loki says to heck with it and releases the goats. Yes. You get this kind of joyful nihilism that's just like, nothing matters. The world's going to end. Everybody eat up. Have fun. Nothing has any consequences whatsoever. whatsoever. <laughs> yeah, that is pure Loki at oh, yeah. that point that is loki's raison d'etre to a t and that image of him right at the end of the scene with his arms raised as destruction is raining behind him is just the perfect loki moment and an iron man one callback a little a little bit, maybe, when Tony is giving the speech towards the beginning of yeah. the movie about the weapons. Yeah. I can see it. Maybe, it's just a little. And now that their theory is proven right, because even though Loki, you know, makes big obvious changes, no variance energy shows up mm -hmm. at this point. Because whatever it is, is just lost under piles and piles of ash and fire. Yeah. The fact that this skeleton is here instead of here yep. does not change the timeline in any significant way nope. whatsoever. And so now that they've proven that theory correct, now they have to find the specific apocalypse that this Loki is hiding out in. You know, I gotta say, I really enjoyed the level of research in this episode. Mm-hmm. There are so many procedurals, especially where you don't get the idea of how much work goes into it, getting to that source. And they've done a very nice job of actually showing Mobius and Loki, like pouring over the files, flipping through the papers, going through the stacks in order to really show the effort. And it helps that this is all very tangible materials. These are files. Yeah. You know, it's not yeah. sitting in front of a computer, dippy, 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 which is not nearly as much fun to watch as <laughs> going through files and files and files. And they do it in such a way that it's not tedious either. No. Like in this scene, we cut to them looking for apocalypses and we see that they're worn out and they've been obviously doing this for a while. And so we show them doing that. But then we immediately have Mobius say, let's go take a break. Right. It gives them that moment of showing, look how much work they're putting in, all the effort it actually takes to find this. But then it also gives them that scene of them just chatting. Yeah. Over Sanka orange cups of coffee. <laughs> so orange. Very bright. Oh, yeah. And here's where we get more into Mobius's love of jet skis. Which brought me to a big old question. Do TVA agents not get vacations? Because it seems like, dude, just drop you off in 93 on a random beach or in a jet ski. We're good. There you go. Well, if they do get vacations, I don't think that they're allowed to take those vacations outside of the TVA. I think it has to be a staycation, so to speak. But at the same time, you're saying with all of these appearing infinite number of buildings and towers and all of that, you're saying you can't have one of these be dedicated to a giant pool where you could jet ski around in? <laughs> exactly. Or even a simulator at some point that simulates being able to do things like jet ski or regular ski or snowmobile or... Right. yeah. But I am calling it now. I think this is Chekhov's jet ski 
and we are going to have Mobius jet skiing around before the final episode is over. I really, 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 I hope this is Chekhov's jet ski. That's beautiful. (laughs) It's not quite as good as Chekhov's flamethrower. That was Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Yes. But Chekhov's jet ski. (laughs) You don't know what the heck we're talking about. Look up Chekhov's gun. I, well, and this conversation gets into more detail on the whole philosophy and setup of the TVA. Yeah, we're yeah, I was just, just going to go there. We're not just talking about this office bureaucracy thing. This is a way of life. This is religion in the end. Well, yeah, because in addition to being their job, it's also their creation story. Yeah. I mean, he says the timekeepers created every single person in the TVA, including myself. And they are promised a peaceful end at the end of it all. Right. You know, you were created, you do your thing that I put you on this pocket dimension to do. And then you will fade once the end of time happens and you will be at peace forever. It's like, wait a minute. (laughs) Will you fade or will you just be allowed to enjoy perfect order? I personally saw it as the latter, as we will get to hang out at the end of time and all will be in order. All right. Yeah. But that's assuming that the timekeepers are doing what they say they're doing. Well, which Mobius, who's telling us this philosophy, does. Oh, yes, definitely. I just don't believe it. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I I think if there's any sort of promise of a perfect afterlife, that always smells wrong, you know? Oh, yeah, completely. Later in this conversation, the scared little boy comment comes back. Right. And now Mobius gets his epiphany moment, and it reminds him of the little boy in France we saw in the first episode. The kid with the kablooey gum. Yes, the kablooey gum comes back and we find out that it was only available for a limited time. It was on sale from 2047 to 2051 in only certain regions. And so that helps them narrow down their apocalypse significantly. Oh, yeah. And I enjoyed some of the alternative apocalypse that were discussed and felt very real yeah yeah (laughs) a little too real in some cases so many of them are climate change based well yes you know and like well and then this happened and this happened and oh the extinction of the swallow which completely screwed up the food chain the ecosystem ecosystem thank you yeah all of that felt too real But the apocalypse that Loki says, this is it, this is the one, is in Alabama in 2050. At Roxcart. Yes. Roxcart is, for those who follow the comics, and you may have noticed it in some of the MCU, Roxxon is a company that exists and has been referenced it all going all the way back to the very first Iron Man movie, there is a Roxxon building in the background when Iron Man and Iron Monger are fighting on the freeway. It's one of those blink and you'll miss it moments, but there are enough super fans out there with pause buttons on their DVD Blu-ray players to not miss it. And so Roxxon has been mentioned multiple times throughout the MCU. And so this is an obvious new iteration of Roxxon that is Walmart, Amazon. It is a giant shopping center slash warehouse where you can get anything. Including James Cameron's lighting. (laughs) <laughs> blinky fluorescent lights were a big thing that james cameron really loved in his movies and we had so many blinky fluorescent lights but we also have blade runner out front with the holographic mom greeting people as they come in still going in the hurricane uh well uh, before that we had the giant welcome to haven hills yeah 
sign, but that gets demolished very quickly. I have to comment on the effects in the show so far. Everything has been movie level studio quality. Even in some of the Marvel movies, there have been effect scenes that you go, ooh, that's a little too cartoony. Uh, a lot of people will call out the Black Panther fight in the Vibranium Mine, mm. especially when they are falling down onto the rail and fighting each other. It is very obviously two animated characters rather than people. Right. So anyway, there are scenes like that in the movies and so far in here with all of the various scenes of destruction we've seen and all of the effects have been top notch mm -hmm. and there is nothing that I have looked at and said, well, that's a special effect and that's bad. There's nothing that has taken me out of the story at right. any point. And these moments before they walk into Rock's cart are included in that because, you know, we see this massive building that they're about to walk into and it totally looks like they are right there when you know that that's not a set. Right. You know, maybe the doors and a little bit of the wall is when they're walking towards it, but that obviously has to be a computer generated building but it doesn't look it uh, the exterior doesn't look the interior was clearly shot within an empty building that would be a walmart or could be a walmart oh yeah definitely that that was either a set or some sort of like you said a, a walmart or <laughs> yeah a repurposed shopping location because the the set dressing for the store did not feel real enough to me to have actually been a walmart or something that actually existed uh, for a store as big as they're implying, their sections were way too close together. And their ceilings were too low. I apparently <laughs> have shopped too much. But it's rare that like your Mega Mart is going to have such a low ceiling as this place did. That makes sense. Uh, your Targets, your Walmarts, your Costcos never have a ceiling that, that low. That is me picking at the nits. But man, so much product placement. <laughs> <laughs> But nothing obvious. There, it was never... No, it was very sensible product placement. Yeah. But I'm pretty sure they said, you know, at some point in the creation of this, it's like, all right, who wants in? And you're going to be in this store at some point where there's some big plot points and some big fights. You know, I love that an, a uh, Roomba was used as a weapon. <laughs> a Roomba and a manual vacuum yeah. as well. <laughs> and an upright vacuum. A yeah. canister vacuum. You never find those anymore. Everything in the Rocks Cart shopping center was great. Starting at the very first moment when Loki walks in and basically snaps his fingers and is dry. <laughs> and B-15 kind of freaks out and is like, what was that? <laughs> One, proof that your magic works again. Two, that shoe squeaking reason is solid. Yeah. But, you know, the real reason was he just didn't want to be uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> there might have been a little showing off. A little bit a little of showing, showing off. off. Oh, yeah, definitely. And there's the basically the mission plan where they decide to split off. And B-15 says, no, I'm taking Loki. And again, B-15 has not given an inch to Loki at any point in the show. She mm -hmm. does not trust him as far as she can throw him i actually think she could throw him pretty hard um, uh, she probably could if she was able to get the leverage yeah but so far he's bested her in combat so yeah, true <laughs> and then we get that shot uh that comes out through the security monitors and shows that the other variant loki is watching all mm -hmm. of this and has that countdown device. And so they have obviously prepared for this moment. Well, Mobius mentions at some point when he's getting approval for the mission that the, you know, Rocks Cart in 2050 is the perfect place to camp out. Yep. It's got food, it's got supplies, it has security, it's about to be wiped off the face of the planet. It's the perfect home base. 
and it's large enough that this Loki could, you know, return over and over mm-hmm. and not necessarily interact with themselves. Mm-mm. So Loki was dead on when he picked this one out of the list of Apocalypse. So yeah, they go off. We get them walking around and talking for a little bit. Now we kind of cut back and forth between the two teams. They broke the cardinal rule of D&D gamers and they split the party. Don't split the party. (laughs) But while that's true for D&D, for story's sake, it makes a lot more sense for them to be in two separate teams as they investigate this massive building. So we cut back and forth between Loki and B-15, kind of scouting the place out. And then in the meantime, Mobius and his guys are searching for the reset charges and are going through everybody's stuff in the shelter. Yeah, this again is where you see some lack of training in dealing with regular people amid the TVA. Maybe they only live to their purpose. You know, they don't necessarily have the empathy in order to deal with people who are scared. Well, you you can see both sides of it. At least I yeah. could. If you know that these people are going to be dead in, say, less than half an hour. Right. And you're on a specific mission. Are you going to care that much about how they feel about your interactions with them? But then at the same time, you I hope that if I were in that situation, that I would be more like Mobius and be like, yes, they're scared, but they shouldn't be scared of us. Yes. We can do our job and still treat these people like human beings, even though we know that they're not going to be with us much longer. Maybe even especially because we know. Exactly. I mean, and freaked out people are dangerous. They may not be all that much afraid of ordinary people, but I mean, heck, it's Alabama. Those guys could have guns. Um, (laughs) You know, you might want to treat the contemporaries, the people who are just there, uh, you know, with some empathy, with some subtlety, just so they don't freak out and, you know, hurt you. Mm -hmm. So we get that little moral quandary there, but... Now the other Loki is finally going to reveal themselves. We get Loki and B-15 finding the man shopping. And as soon as he touches B-15, this green energy flows between them. And the man falls unconscious. And now B-15 is possessed by Loki. Yep. Which we saw at the Renaissance Fair. Right. Yes. But- now we get more into the mechanics of it as opposed to the ooh. Yeah, at the Renaissance Fair, it was a little weird because we also saw brief glimpses of that Loki acting at the same time. Right. So it felt like C20 was mind controlled Mm -hmm. while B15 was possessed. Agree. It felt like a different level of control. And I have to give the actress credit here. That's a big shift. Yeah, making the shift from playing the hunter to playing another Loki. And they give each other the head tilt and smirk and mirror each other perfectly in that moment there. Well, and uh, this is another shout to... uh... Wumi Masaku, who I'm hoping I'm saying that right, um, who is B15. Uh, she was also Ruby in Lovecraft Country. And towards the end of it, she has kind of a similar, yet still very different thing. But, you know, it's her body with a different character in it. Right. And she was very good at doing that, too. So this is an actress with some serious versatility to her. Yeah, I was very impressed and laughed out loud when they gave each other the the smirk Mm -hmm. when the the smarm was a two-way street it was (laughs) enjoyable to watch we get a quick moment where mobius's team finds c20 and she says something that i'm really curious to see how this is going to play out 
she just keeps repeating it's real oh which leads us to the question of what's real yeah it's so vague i don't even have a theory at this Mm-mm. point yeah far but, too vague but it was it was definitely something that i heard and noticed and said this is going to be important later because they ask her what what's real what is it and she doesn't say but then again we cut back from there to the two loki's talking and the other variant loki who i'm going to start giving a new nickname soon (laughs) but i want to wait for that reveal to do that they move into randy from Roxcart. And there was another moment there that I thought was very telling, which is our Loki calls them Loki, and they say, ugh, don't call me that. Interesting. We said in the previous episode that a lot of this show is probably going to be touching on identity and Mm -hmm. who you are and who you believe to be. And so the fact that this other Loki doesn't want to be known by that name says that they are very different they are trying to carve out a completely different identity even though they still hang on to some of the things that make them obviously loki right so next episode i think we're we're going to learn a lot about this other loki i hope so because that's getting interesting yeah And then after that, we get another cut back to Mobius and C-20, and she stopped repeating it's real, and now she says, I gave it away. And this one, we do find out what it is. Right. It is the location of the timekeepers. Right. I gave it away how to find them. Yep. Which is weird, because that doesn't seem to be necessary to this Loki's plan, from what we've seen so far, at least. Hmm. No, not so far, but we also don't have many details of the Loki's plan or the the variant Loki's plan. We don't know what the next phase of their plan is, but this first phase didn't require the timekeeper's location at all. But we'll get to that first phase and, and how it ends in just a second. We get some more fighting between Loki and the various possessed people. Yeah, we go from uh, Randy, the nice young store clerk, to Bubba, the Alabama guy. (laughs) Exactly who you think it is. Yeah, yeah, pretty much your stereotypical southern trucker. I went to high school with that guy, I swear. (laughs) (laughs) And another little moment that made me laugh out loud during that fight was when loki gets thrown down onto the ground and the little robot dog comes oh, up just to him oh just bonks him on the head yeah just little little barking and bonking him on the head yeah it's those little touches that that make a fight interesting to watch and not just two people punching each other over right. and over but Now we finally get the reveal of Lady Loki. The hood comes back and I go, hey, that's Annette Benning," And then I go, no, wait, that's way too young to be Annette Benning." (laughs) (laughs) She's also already been in the Marvel Universe. The actress just bore quite the resemblance. I double checked her to make sure that wasn't one of Annette Benning's kids. (laughs) It is not. (laughs) Cannot remember her name. Sophia DiMartino. And she is... An English actress, not too surprising, given Tom Hiddleston's. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I remember looking through her and she's just, she's been on every major British show that, you know, runs through actresses, right, and actors, right and left. So I think there's a casualty in Midsummer Murders and some of these series that have nine jillion episodes. So every actor in England and then some have been on these shows at some point. Well, it looks like she was a major character on Casualty, at least yeah. for a while, because she was in 83 different episodes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Nice stint on Casualty. I don't know how many episodes there were, but it ran from 2006 to 2011, so that's probably close to all of them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and like the previous episode, I've been watching with the subtitles on. Oh. And so they just refer to her as the variant 
as she is listed on IMDb. Right. But I am going to refer to her as Lady Loki because that is how she is referred to in the comics when she appears in that form. And so there is some comic book history that we can get into. Uh Uh-oh. The first time that we get a Loki who is not just disguising themselves as a woman, but is Loki as a woman, is in Straczynski's run again. We mentioned it back in the previous episode. And he is one of the creators that is listed in the special thanks in the Loki show credits. The first time we see her is after one of the Ragnaroks, basically, and most of the Asgardians have apparently died, but then been sort of reincarnated into humans on Earth. And Thor was the only one who was still aware of his godhood, and his mission for the first few issues of this run were finding the reincarnated as guardians and awakening them to their past, bringing them out of their mortal memories and returning their godlike memories to them. And somehow Loki had taken the body that was intended for Sif. Oops. But I would think Loki would embrace such a accident. <laughs> oh, she definitely did. There she, we go. This this was not accidental. <laughs> this was part of a scheme. And so that's what Loki looked like for some time. And then later, Loki goes through some experiences that kind of give him a crisis of conscience. And Loki gets his own title. He gets his own ongoing series for a while that is titled Loki, Agent of Asgard. And in that book, Loki will shift back and forth between being male and female, depending on their specific needs for the mission that they are going on. And one of the supporting cast of that title is a woman named Verity, who has the power to tell if someone is telling the truth or lying. Well, the name means truth. Right. So when he tells her that both of these forms are valid, this is where in the comics that Loki is affirmed to basically be gender fluid. And in a story a little bit later called The Tenth Realm, Odin, when talking to Thor, Angela, and Loki, Angela has a long complicated history, but long story short, has been revealed to be Odin's lost daughter. How Zeus of him. So Odin refers to the trio as my son, my daughter, and the one who is both. Aww. And so we have a Lady Loki in the comics who is definitively evil in the first story where Loki takes Sif's intended body and uses that as part of a scheme to get Thor banished from Asgard. But in the Agent of Asgard story, we have a Lady Loki who is on the side of the angels, Mm -hmm. who is working for Asgard and doing their dirty work to a certain extent, but doing it for the right reasons, working on the side of good. And now here's the really interesting thing to me. The Lady Loki in the show has one horn broken on her helmet. Really? If you go back and look, her helmet has the two horns, but one of them is broken off and it has like a jagged edge. Uh. In the comics, that look has appeared on Loki only when he has been on the side of good. Interesting. So while we've been presented this entire time as Lady Loki being the evil person working against the TVA... I think we're going to find out that she is basically doing this for the right reasons. That she is 
not the villain that she has been painted as. And that calls back to holding out for a hero yep. as the fight occurs with the mind-controlled C-20 mm-hmm. and her fighting. And so she, as the song says, we now know where all the heroes have gone and where are all the gods. She's right there and she's working for us. Nicely done. Thank you. <laughs> Very nicely done. Huh. And this is one of the things that makes Marvel movies great because that speaks to you directly. You know stuff. Mm-hmm. But yeah, you know, I can still enjoy it as a casual member. It does great. I'll have a bigger reveal later on. But you've Not got more, but <laughs> <laughs> whatever. Not a big believer in spoilers. But right. personally, that's just yeah. me. But it has this whole, you know, the layers of meaning to it that, you know, as a fan, you know, as a more casual observer, you know, I get later on, but those details are there waiting to be picked up. Right. I will also make a note that what Lady Loki is wearing and what the flashes of Loki in the green vest are wearing, that's not a helmet. That is a diadem. Okay. I went to fashion school. Yes, you did. (laughs) When you said it, I knew the word and I knew what it meant. Yep. But normally what Loki wears is a helmet. Yes. And when I read it on the internet, they usually refer, they almost always refer to it as his helmet, even when it is the diadem. Because like you said, we've seen that bit in the trailer where he's in the suit with the vote Loki pin on mm-hmm. his lapel and he's he's wearing a diadem, not a full-sized helmet. Yeah. That specific look comes straight from the comics. Yeah. From the Vote Loki miniseries. I actually do remember seeing that cover. I, you know, wasn't necessarily didn't get into it, didn't pursue it, but I remember seeing that at some point. I'm like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> I did know the right word and I, yeah. I should have been using the right word, but well, and that being I, I said, dumb sometime. I'm using diadem, not crown, <laughs> because it is not sitting on top of the head right? and it doesn't go completely around. Mm-hmm. That is kind of your differentiation between diadem and crown. Diadem is doing that forehead pointy thing. It doesn't necessarily have to point, but it's like your center of focus is in the forehead region, not on top of the head. This is very important. You should know this. <laughs> <laughs> well, new information is always good. <laughs> I love adding to my vocabulary. And while Diadem, I swear, was already in it. <laughs> well, it may have been kicking around, but it wasn't necessarily like you could tell the difference. If I set out a Diadem, a tiara, and a crown, and then said, identify these pieces of head jewelry, you'd be like, yeah, those are crowns probably true yeah if on the other hand you said which one is a tiara which one is a crown and which one is a diadem i would immediately go that one that one that one yeah if i gave you the vocabulary and told you to match it to the object you could pull that off if i just said identify these objects you'd be like uh crowns (laughs) but you know i would do better than head thingy other head thingy and (laughs) third head thingy (laughs) third head migraine neck ache uh hair puller (laughs) moving on let's talk about what lady loki did she has all of those reset charges around rock's cart and she lets them all loose and they don't blow up at rock's cart she uses the tva's technology to send them to various places along the timeline. Mm -hmm. And these things going off cause these very quick branches off of the timeline. And, you know, the TVA is immediately in emergency mode, calling out a code triple zero because somebody bombed the timeline. Mm Mm-hmm. And that looks like every NASA movie when something goes wrong in space and you have the NASA guys freaking out. Right. And so now we have a multiverse. Yep. The question is, are the TVA going to be able to 
stave some of these timelines, all of them. I mean, we know, again, the next Doctor Strange movie is Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. And we know it's the same writer as Loki. Right. And so we know it seems likely that Loki will end with some sort of multiverse existing. The question is, who's going to be the power behind it? Right. And for what purpose? Right. Why did Lady Loki want a multiverse? Well, and as Lady Loki says, as she departs, she tells our Loki that this isn't about him. Right. And that that final moment where she walks away into the portal and then Loki, despite Mobius screaming, wait, don't. (laughs) Loki jumps in after her. Right. And so this next episode, I know the first episode went a little slow for some people. There's a lot to set up. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, I I completely agree. That's what I replied to anyone who was on my Twitter feed who was like, I don't know about this so far. And I was like, give it a moment. (laughs) Give it at least an episode. It had a whole lot of setup it had to do. This one followed through and is making me look forward to episode three so much. My usual rule with trying a new show is give it three episodes. Yeah. Yeah. Unless you really hate it right off the bat, give it three episodes because that first one has to do a lot of heavy lifting, you know, to pull you in, to set it up. And there's so much setup that has to be done with the TVA. There are a lot of rules here. Yeah. Especially with a show like this. Oh, yeah. With, say, Falcon and Winter Soldier as a counterexample. As long as you know who Falcon is and you know who Winter Soldier is, you pretty much know all you need to know going in right uh captain america's gone you need to know the end of end game and yeah yeah (laughs) but there's not many new characters Mm -hmm. or strange situations that need to be set up whereas this show is so high concept Mm -hmm. that it had to give you the miss minutes presentation (laughs) and say here's what's going on this is the (laughs) buy-in You have to accept this. Okay. Now you know what the show is about. Now next episode, we can actually start. Right. That wraps up this week's discussion. Episode 3 of Loki has already released, and having watched it, I'm really looking forward to continuing my conversation with Anne on all the revelations we received there and what they may mean for the series and the MCU at large going forward. While we've got another month of Loki-related discussions, don't forget that most of this podcast's episode's topics are suggested by listeners like you. If you have something you want to know more about, please email me at welcometogeektown, all spelled out, at gmail.com. Or you can go to the website, welcome to, the number two in this case, geektown.com, and click the Submit a Question link if you prefer to ask more anonymously. Other contact options include facebook.com slash welcome to geektown or twitter at geektown podcast. If you'd like to support the show directly, you can do so at patreon.com slash welcome to geektown, where for just a dollar per month, you get access to scripts of the show, audio outtakes, and a monthly shout out. You can also help the show grow by subscribing and giving a five star review on Apple Podcasts which helps other people find the show so we can all tell them Welcome to Geek Town, Population, Us. Welcome to Geek Town is written, narrated, edited, and produced by me, Kurt Onstead. Theme music is by Aaron Levitz, logo art by Archie Santana. All other sound clips are the copyrighted material, their respective owners, and no infringement is intended, falling under fair use.